Bowling Green saying he's picked up our signal on YouTube and and he enjoys the class and helps him get through the thing. Now I don't want to say it too much because maybe his instructor is also watching it. Anyway, sorry, he said that your his instructor sucked. But anyway, all right. Um, so so that's kind of fun. But anyway, all right. Let's let's <coughs> I did for the afternoon class if you go to the afternoon class the 2:30 class we win this big thing so i can drop the screen and write on the board at the same time we don't have that luxury so i'm just going to have to kind of write out the problems for you um this is assignment 11 and basically what what we did this uh we'll do what we did this afternoon i apologize for the jacket but my actual shirt got soaking wet even with an umbrella walking from the as i call it the h1n1 diner to here the the chow hall here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you pick up a plate, it kinda, it's kind of rough. It's like, ooh, might want to scrape and watch this one more time. Anyway, all right, so here we go. What we've been talking about, what, what, what chapter seven is all about is going around in a circle, okay? And there's two ways to go around in a circle. One is uniformly with uniform speed. Of course, your velocity is changing all the time, so therefore, since it's changing all the time, that gives you an acceleration towards the center of the circle, all right? So if you go into uniform circular motion, UCM, okay? Uniform circular motion, all right? And um, here's, here's the acceleration going in, V is going this way, and the centripetal acceleration equals V squared over R, and MAC is the net force. Keep that in mind. Took me two years of teaching, well, studying, getting my, it's my co-discipline, my PhD. I, it took me forever to figure this out. Oh, so I'm going to tell you right now what the textbook is always saying, and I kept missing it over reading the, the MAC is the net force that's for uniform circular motion. Now, if this guy speeds up, though, while he's going around the circle, let's say we put a retro rocket on him or something like that, and he's going to go around the circle, then all bets are off. It's not uniform circular motion anymore. He's actually speeding up. And then we get a tangential acceleration. So if you speed up, going around the... the, the bend. Okay, if you speed up going this way, then you'll, you'll have two components of acceleration. You'll have AC and AT, okay, which will add up. We'll, we'll go ahead and put that AT right here like that, and you actually have your acceleration is going like that towards the center. And AT is equal to R times alpha, where we found out that alpha is the angular acceleration, all right? Alpha is the angular acceleration. We also know this, that V is equal to R times little omega, right? Got a little omega there. And omega, what's the units for omega? Degrees per second, yes, but that's, no. There we go. We'll go with radians per second, but don't change your calculators, all right? Because we will just deal with, um, we're not going to be converting degrees to um, radians. That's, that's for a trig class, not for this. So that's in radians per second, all right? So when I take this radians per second and multiply it by meters, you pretty much throw the radians out and put meters in there, okay? Oh, that reminds me. James showing up, reminded me of something. Um, James sent me an impassioned, e not to throw his stuff out on Front Street, but he sent me an impassioned email saying, and I, and I heard him, but I just couldn't reach him. Um, he said, hey, I missed the hints, and I couldn't figure out why all the problems weren't having hints anymore on the thing. And so, um, and the reason is I'm picking the end of chapter problems, and they don't come with hints for some reason. I don't know why. So I threw one that has hints. So what we're doing today, we're going to do. All, I'm going to give you hints. We're going to go through the entire 
homework assignment. And, and yeah, so you can get started on it and do hints. I think that's a kind of a good way to approach this. Give you kind of the shotgun thing on Tuesday with a little quiz, and then do the homework stuff on Thursday. So then you can have the weekend, ruin your weekend by trying to finish up the homework. All right, so here we go. So anyway, that's, that's why, those because I've gotten several emails from students saying, I, I really miss the hints. And, and it's like, yeah, I don't know why they're not there. And the reason is because I'm picking the end of chapter problems. All right, let's see. So we got radius per second. And then if we're going to go a distance around here, if we're going to go a distance around here, we've got S. I'm actually kind of doing this backwards. S equals R times theta. Now remember, theta is in radians. So that's where we get our r times 2 pi, our, our 2 pi r is for the circumference of a circle. Um, because, you, because if I go completely around, I go 2 pi, uh, it goes 2 pi completely around. So if I got the change in s over the change in t equals r times the change in theta over the change in t, all right? For those of you who've had a little calculus, this is oomp, wop, oomp, wop. That's the sound of the men working on the chain rule. Sorry, bad math joke. Anyway, <laughs> do y'all remember that song, the chain gang? Well, this is the chain rule. Some of you haven't had calculus, so you have no idea what I'm talking about. You probably don't even remember that song. But anyway, um, so this turns into V equals R times omega, all right? And then dv, uh, let's do it this way, dv dt equals um, r times d omega dt. Again, we're doing algebraically, but it, as we shrink this down, let it go to an infinitesimal. It's the calculus version of it. Well, change in velocity or change in time is what? An acceleration, yes. This is our ac, so this comes out to be... Um, R. Woo! This is AT actually. There we go. Whoa! Good catch. Save myself from having the people at Bowling Green laugh at me for not knowing what's going on. All right, so there we go. It's R alpha. That's AT because that's my change of velocity. So if I'm changing my velocity, in other words, here's my velocity vector here, then it gets bigger here. Now it's a bigger velocity, even bigger here. That means it's accelerating in that direction, too. So it's a tangential acceleration. All right. And last but not least, last little, for, well, we got a couple more. V squared, or, or um, V also equals R times omega squared. That's another one we can use. Okay. Because if V equals, oh, that makes no sense whatsoever. Let's try that. Sorry. Because if V equals R times omega, then V squared over R would be R squared over omega squared divided by R, leaves us R omega squared, right? Okay, this is all a review from Tuesday. Now, I kind of went off on this a little bit today in the class, showing why physics is so hard for first time learners, all right, to the subject. What does this stand for when we're talking about going around in a circle? The capital T. The period. What else has capital T stood for? Tension. What else? The tangential acceleration. Temperature. You see it as temperature too. So uh, you got to know which one we're talking about. This is T. This is the period. T. And that's how long to make a circle? How long to make a circle? All right, that's the period. And we can also say that omega equals 2 pi divided by the period that it takes to go around. Okay. So if I if <coughs> if I if I make one revolution per second, one revolution is two pi divided by one. So my omega is two pi. Okay. And 
And here's a tough question. What's 1 over t? What? Yes. Frequency. Frequency. And that is measured in what? Hertz. Right. Okay. Right. It's in hertz. And it's one it's seconds. The units are it's the units are hertz. We'll deal with hertz much more when we get to um, electricity and magnetism when we talk about the frequency of a of a AC circuit and those kinds of fun things. Um, it's kind of funny because it's s to the negative one. And so also, then we don't deal with frequency too much in this course. All right. Well, there we go. There's a, there's Tuesday. There's Tuesday night in 17 minutes. 14 minutes, basically. All right, so we're all caught up from Tuesday night. Um, and let's get started with the homework problems then. OK, now, this is going to be a little bit difficult because I can't really show them to you all. I'll have to read them. But I brought them right here. OK, here's problem number one. Problem number one says this. Now, we're not going to work them out, but we'll definitely give us a good push. Get us in the right direction. OK? All right. So um, here we go. It says, the hour, minute, and second hands on a clock are, um, are so many meters long, respectively. And it, OK? And um, what we want to know is this. The uh, hour hand, length of the hour hand, length of the hour hand is 0.2, sorry, 0.22 meters. Length of the second hand, it, or minute hand, let's go with minute hand, is um, 0.28 meters. And the length of the second hand is 0.37 meters. All right. So we got a clock, OK? Now, we want to know, here's what we want to know. What are the distances traveled by the tips of the hand in 35 minutes? By the tips of each hand in 35 minutes? Well, let's start with the easiest one first. That's the second hand. Now, what have they given us here? What are these links? What would these links be as we're going around in a circle? To us, the radius, exactly. These are the radius. So we need what we're trying to do is find theta. Okay? And here's a question for you. Does your watch go at a constant velocity or constant speed? Yeah, for what well, go, eh, eh, but but basically it's going at a constant speed. So therefore, theta equals omega times t. Great. Oh, what's the, what's the first? OK. I won't worry about that right now. <laughs> um, uh, theta equals omega times t. Um, yeah. Just a second. I'm, I'm thinking about something. It's bothering me. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to change this to seconds because omega is in radians per second. We'll do that in a, in, a, in, a, in a little bit. 35 minutes, the way we convert that to seconds is to do what? Yeah, multiply by 60. But the first thing we're going to do is theta equal, and we also know this, that omega equals um, r v over r what does that do for me i forgot completely how to work this problem I, and i already did it okay hold up v equals r times omega and so we've got v over r does this give us this doesn't get us anywhere yeah, you can figure out velocity. times r times omega but i don't know omega, omega. okay 
If I don't know my velocity. Oh, that's right. Okay, so here we go. I remember now. I was a little embarrassed. All of a sudden, I just kind of had this um, vapor lock in the brain here. All right, so we want to find theta. Let's find theta for the second hand. First of all, how many times does that second hand, how many revolutions does it make? Oh, I remember what we're after. We're, we want to know the distance. S equals R times theta. So we got to find theta. That's it. That's what we're after. So how many times does this, does this um, on, for the second, let's start with the second hand. How many revolutions does it do in 35 minutes? 35. So how many radians is that? 70 times pi. Exactly. Because it goes 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi, 35 times. So theta for that equals 70 times pi, okay? And so S equals R equals 0.37 times 70 times pi. That's what we're after. We're not after the velocity, we're after theta. <clears throat> I was getting ahead of myself to another problem. All right, so now let's take a look at this minute hand. This causes us a little bit of problem because the minute hand does one swoop in how many minutes? 60 minutes. Okay, so here's what we got to do. We've got to go 2 pi is to 60 as equals um, some theta is to what? 35. Very good. There's your insight into how to do those. All right. So now theta equals 70 pi divided by 60, which is 7 pi over 6. Aha! There's my theta. Now, what about the minute hand? Or the hour hand. How far did it go compared compared to the uh, compared to the minute hand? How far does it go? Does it travel in one complete? In other words, it'll go if after one hour it only moves like doing like that, right? So we got to figure out how many doings there are here. All right. Here's the here's the here's the key to it. How many hours are there in a day, in a half day? Twelve. Take this theta right here. Divide it by twelve. And you're on your way. Because that's how far it would go. Okay? Because it goes one twelfth, the it, it covers one twelfth the distance that the that the second hand does, or that the minute hand does. All right, it works. It works. So basically, for the hour, the theta for the hour hand, the theta for the hour um, basically turns out to be this equals uh, seven pi for this problem over six divided by twelve, which basically gives me seven pi over, what's 12 times 6? 72? Which, which is about right. Pi over 10 is pretty close. Of course, now, your radius, your radii, and your minutes are going to be different. The hour hand is tricky. We should have, if, if I was not assigning this via computer, I'd have just had to do the second and the minute hand. All right. Okay, problem two. We'll leave that one there. Here's where I got in trouble for. All right, I love problem two because it's just so silly. All right, here's what problem two says. Listen to this. It says, the driver of a car sets the cruise control and ties the steering wheel so that the car travels in a uniform speed, V, in the circle. 
I'm going to do that. Set the cruise control. Let's tie the steering wheel. And let's set the cruise control. Okay. Obviously, he's in a big parking lot where nobody else is. All right. And it was certainly with a certain diameter. Through what angular distance does the car move? And what are the lengths it travels in? If we have this, here's the situation. The driver of the car says cruise control. So we've got, all right, first of all, I got a question for you. It says here, he sets the cruise control at 14 meters per second. First question is this, is that omega or V? Omega or V? V, yes, because it's meters per second. That's your tip off meters per second. Omega, little omega, is in radians per second. All right? So we've got 14 meters per second. So this is V. And it says the diameter is 130 meters. So radius is what? 65 meters. There you go. 65 meters. All right, now. It asks you this. Part A says, what angular distance does the car travel? Angular distance. Angular distance. Well, can we do that? Here's where I got into trouble before. All right, so we know this. We know that V, well, what? How far is he going to go? How far is he going to go? Uh, oh, did it give us a time? You need a time, don't you? Oh, three and a half minutes. Ha! T equals 3.5 minutes. Sorry. That's 210 seconds. There we go. Now we can do this without any trouble. All right. Oh, boy, I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, so here's the deal. The deal. V equals R times omega. And then, since it's at a constant rate, theta equals um, omega times T. So what, I have to, so what am I going to have to do? Find omega? This is, see, I was ahead on this problem. I was thinking of this one. All right. So what, so what you're going to have to do is do this first. Find little omega, which is in radians per second. And then take that, because it's constant, it's uniform circular motion, that omega is not changing. So it's just omega times t. And that will give you your distance, the, the, the angle. Now, how far did he go? That's real easy. The, the actual S distance, doesn't matter if he's going in a circle or not. It's just, it's just 210 times 14, right? Should be. But it still works out. So you also want to find S, which is just V times T. Or you could even take V, which is, you could say S is equal to R omega times T also. If you wanted to go that one step further, you do that. All right. Okay. All right, then the next problem is this. I guess we're up to problem three. It starts going, it, 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 it picks up. All right, this is kind of like a Ivory and Merchant movie. It'll pick up towards the middle. Right. Actually, they get more boring. All right. Okay. Problem three says this. It says the tangential speed of a, a particle on a rotating wheel is V. If the particle is R from the axis of rotation, how long will the particle take to make one revolution? How long to make one revolution? Actually, what are we after here? The period, exactly. So we've got omega, 
So for problem three, you've, what they're after is omega equals 2 pi over t. We want to find t. Okay? All right? And it says this. The tangential speed of the rotating wheel um, is 3 meters per second. And it has a radius. V equals 3.0 meters per second. And it has a radius of 0.2 meters. That's my, that's my data. But again, can we figure out what omega is based on these two guys? Yeah, piece of cake. Piece of cake. We got it. We got it. We're cooking. We go, all right. Omega equals V over R. And so we get V over R equals 2 pi over T. Let's see, let's just look at the algebra of this, see if it makes sense. So V equals 2 pi R over T. Does that make sense? There's a good old 2 pi R. And that's going around in a circle. That's one lap, right? There's one lap. And so um, T equals 2 pi R over V. Yep, that makes sense to us because that's the distance divided by V gives me the time, right? Looks complicated, but it's really not all that. What's that? It's starting to make sense. Oh, oh darn. i got to change our tactic then. You're supposed to be baffled <laughs> till January. Till you take physics too, then I'll baffle you again till May. All right? This is not good. No, it's all right. All right, now, the killer problem. All right? The killer problem. And this is actually a very difficult problem. And it's one of those ones where you're going to have questions about it, and you're going to be thinking about it, and all that kind of stuff. And what? And your the the book the the book the master in physics asked for it in terms of weight, all right. But I just kind of want want to let you think about this for a minute. I might edit. I might make this an extra credit problem if you actually get it. I think I'll edit the thing. That's the nice thing about mastering physics. I can edit it. One of the things I didn't like about Wiley Plus was if I edited an assignment and somebody else had already, one of the students had already done it, all their data was wiped out. That was not good because I did that once. I, wanted, I changed the due date. thought I was helping people out. Turned out three-fourths of students wiped out there. I was like, oh. So what do you do? You give them 100%. So it's the only thing you can do. All right. Anyway. Um, all right. So here's the problem. You're probably going, well, what is this problem? Here it is. Not bad. All right. Basically, what I've got is, and I don't know how to, I, I used to draw these all the time when I was sitting in church, these little biplanes like this. When I was bored, you went, oh, we're only to the offering. Anyway. All right, now, got an airplane. And he's going to do a loop-de-loop. -loop. All right? Got a jet aircraft, actually. He's going to do a loop-de-loop. -loop. He's going to be here. And he's going to go in uniform circular motion. He's going to have constant uh, V speed. Uniform speed will be constant. And he's going to come up, so he's going to be upside down right here. Because when I was a little kid, Snoopy and the Red Baron were big, so you draw a little Snoopy dog in here. Okay? Anyway. All right. Now, the question is this. Here's the question. Is, and we've got to raise. Is the normal force greater at the top or at the bottom of this? When he, when he, goes when he does a circular loop. Where's the normal force the greatest? Now what you got to remember is that AC AC is negative here. But it is MAC is the net force every time. Okay? The net force the net force is equal to MAC which equals M V squared over R. Okay, so we got this R here. So where do you think 
Part A of this question is pretty easy. You get, you get unlimited attempts and it's, and it's a multiple choice of two. Okay? So you should be on your way. You should be able to get this one. All right? It says, is it at the top of the, which, which is the greater uh, normal force? At the bottom of the loop or at the top? Which do you think? 50-50 chance. Steve is why? At the top, the gravity's pulling him away from his seat, right? Yeah. But at the bottom, he's being pushed into his own side. He's guessing the bottom. Guessing. He's making sense. He's making sense. Let's go with what Steve said. It's at the bottom, and let's see mathematically why that is. All right. It's kind of like remember when we first started talking about this stuff, when we have the bucket of water and we go like this with the bucket of water and it doesn't spill, same, same principle. The bucket is much heavier down here, right? The water field is, ah, kind of pulls on you right here. And this is also another reason why you'll never see a roller coaster with a perfectly circular loop, right? Because your, your patrons at your amusement park will start pulling like 2.9 Gs down here, right? And that's not good because they pass out and they have heart attacks and it's just bad. All right, it's just not a good way to do things. So that's why roller coasters are always in teardrops or corkscrew type things. So you want to give people a thrill, but you don't want to kill them. All right. So now, so this is the deal. So let's look at let's look at Snoopy here in right here. Let's look at the free body diagram down here. You've got he's got mg exactly like Steve said. You got mg pushing down like that. You got the normal force pushing up like this, and the net acceleration, you've got a net acceleration going up like that. Just like on our pulleys and blocks, okay? Now, let's look at the sum of the forces here. Sum of the forces in the y direction then equals v squared over r, mv squared over r, which is my AC, MAC. Let me write that in first. No, yeah, MA. By the way, what does AC stand for, real quick? Centripetal acceleration, right. Stands for the centripetal acceleration. Okay, equals mv squared over r. But now let's look at my free body diagram with the two forces. I've got m minus mg. And so the normal force equals mv squared over r plus mg. Oh. You're pulling G's, okay? Pulling some severe G's here. Let's look at the top one. I'm going to just change this one a little bit. Let's look at what's going on at the top. Now, at the top, remember, he's, he's coming around, and we're looking at instantaneously right here. So what Snoopy want to do as he's coming around, when he's at this point, which way does he want to go? Which way does he, does he want to go? He wants to go and keep flying off this way, right? He wants to keep flying off that way. So, he's actually got his seat, he's got MG going this way. I'll just draw the free body diagram. He's got MG going this way, and he's got a little bitty normal force that's, that's keeping him this right here on the seat, just barely pushing on him down this way. I told you, it's one of those things where you just got to kind of let it flow over you for a minute and think about it. All right? As he's coming up around here. He's coming up. He's, and the seat is pushing down on him. Okay? The seat's pushing down on him. So is MG. So he's got this little bitty normal force, and we've got AC going this way. So... When we look at this guy, we got to make this negative because AC is going down. That we're looking at just right at this instant here. AC is going down, and we've got minus the normal force minus mg. Let's multiply by negative one. Let's multiply everything by negative one, and we wind up with this: mv squared over r equals n plus mg. And so therefore, n, the normal force here, 
equals uh, mv squared over r minus mg. So this is at the bottom. This is at the top. And I think uh, Master in Physics um, says if the speed of the aircraft is 800 kilometers per hour and the radius of the circle is um, 2.0 kilometers, calculate the normal force exerted. Express your, oh, what's the express your answer in terms of W? Huh. They're annoying. So, um, well, W equals mg, and so m equals W over g. That's what they want you to do. So they want you to take this and stick it in here. All right? So you're going to say n over b, this is what your answer will look like. n over b is equal to W over g times r over v squared, which you can calculate. They give you v squared and r plus w. All right? And then this one would be w over g times uh, v squared over r minus w, minus w. So you can actually find it in terms of w because you know g, you know v squared, you know r, and you know um, w. I just had that insight as to what they're asking for. I don't know why they just didn't bother to give us the mass of the guy. But they didn't. I don't know why. So what is the Wait. Yeah. You're, you're not going to find a number. Oh. You're going to find a number. You're going to find something. You're going to find a gobbledygook number here <laughs> times W minus W. Okay. In other words, this will turn out to be, um, make sure this is 800 kilometers per hour right now. Make sure you change it to meters per second, divided by the radius they give you, uh, and then divide it again by 9.8. Okay. It's kind of ugly. It's kind of ugly. All righty. Wasn't that fun? I love that problem. That's a classic problem. I know how and Ting Yi had to get through it to, to get their degree in physics, right? You've worked this problem? Yep. See? Told you. All right. Okay, now. Okay, now we get into the fun stuff. We get into making margaritas. All right? Blenders. All right? We're going to talk about blenders. After this problem, we need a margarita. Yes, James. What? Like settling, like in a rotation environment. Like oh, you're asking me a geosciences question? Kind of. Oh, kind of. I don't know anything about geosciences. So oh, this is dirt out there. It's dirt. What's that? Oh, sedimentation and all that stuff? Oh, but because the Earth is spinning? Would that cause it? Like, yeah. Well, like, like in a more localized environment, like just every cylinder is spinning and it is. Oh, you want to sift some stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how a centrifuge works. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is a centrifuge. This is how a centrifuge works. Okay? All right. And well, what the centrifuge has, it, it has real, um, it's got a semi permeable wall, right? That allows the white blood, the red blood cells to go out, but it traps the white blood cells in. Right? It'd be like if you were on this finished fling, remember our quiz question? Tuesday, we had the, the finished fling, the rotating worlds of fun, where you stand in the room and it spins and the floor drops. Okay, it'd be like if you had one of those rides and it would just trap the adults, could, can't fit through the cracks, but like kids could. And you turn that thing on, you'd have all these kids flying out of it. That'd be kind of, but that's the way a centrifuge works. All right, because they want to keep going, because they'll get going and they'll want to keep going in a straight line. And if there's not, no wall there to hold them, they'll just keep going straight. But the the but the adult but the uh, white blood cells get trapped inside the centrifuge. So that's how that works. All right. Okay. Let's talk about this. Oh yeah, we're going to talk about this is problem five, I think. 
it goes quicker, right? My thing came up all screwed up. Oh! Now this one's different. This one's different. All right. Here's what we've got. Um, I've got a space colony here. I think this is the right one. This is for 32. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. All right. I've got a space colony. This one's kind of fun. It's a rotating cylinder that's 16 kilometers long. All right? And a D diameter of, um, and it has a diameter D, and it has an ang The question is, what angular speed is that? Omega or V? Which one is that? Angular speed, omega. Which omega does it need to rotate at so that the people in the space colony feel like they're on Earth? In other words, so we create a G force of 9.8 meters per second squared. Who can we do that? <laughs> John is going, yeah, if you show us, here we can. Okay. Well, what did we say earlier? Didn't we say earlier that so this is this is for your space colony. This is your space colony problem. Alright? Colony. Is that how you spell colony? It doesn't seem right. Anyway. All right, that's why I don't teach English. Okay, now, because I can't spell. All right, so we've got this uh, space colony, and it's got a diameter. Do they give me a diameter? Well, they give, it's got a radius of r. That's given. r is given. Okay, I don't care how long it is. That doesn't make any difference. But we're going to rotate this thing so that people walking around feel like they have gravity. That's one of the big problems they have with shuttle astronauts. Um, is osteoporosis sets in um, when you're weightless for that long? For some reason, you have a, you have a lot of bone loss, and we don't know why. And so, one of our physicists downstairs, Dr. Zhu, one of the things that he works on is he creates uh, a levit by using magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields. He levitates mice, and he can levitate the mice for a long, long time. So he creates an anti-gravity situation. And so we can study the mice for a long time and see why they have this bone loss thing. It's kind of cool, all right? But it's also kind of tedious because you've you got to pay some lab assistant to watch this mouse for 12 hours, three weeks. You know, call, have these different lab assistants come in watching a mouse levitate. And the mice don't like it when it first happens. They get up, so they really do. They're like, eh, you can just kind of see them go, eh, what's going on? <laughs> then they kind of get used to it after a while. Okay. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. All right. Okay, now, I got off track. Oh, but in the space colony. So we want to create a gravitational situation so they don't have osteoporosis if they're going to be up there for a long time. All right. Because sound needs a medium to travel in. Space is a vacuum, and if bad things happen in space, no one can hear you scream, right? You know what the movie Aliens said? You all remember that? You all see the movie Aliens? No? A few of you? Okay, a few of you. All right. Anyway, all right. So, now, we want to know, oh, but we got this. This is going to be 9.8. Think you can solve that? Find omega, if far is given. I think so. I think we're all over it. Okay. All right. Now let's make margaritas. So, oh, so we got a fan. I forgot. This book is kind of, this book's kind of, we talk about a fan blade, all right? Which, I saw a stupid human trick on Letterman once where a guy stopped a fan blade with his tongue. Did y'all ever see that one? That's kind of interesting. It's like, oh wow. The things you learn at fraternity parties. But anyway. Hey Moose, put your th tongue in that fan. Okay. All right, anyway. All right. All right, it says here the blades of the fan are running at a low speed. Omega naught 
equals 230 RPMs. 230 RPMs. Ooh! We haven't seen this before. What does RPMs mean? Revolutions per minute. How do I get that into radians per second? 2 pi? No, I don't think we'll divide by 2 pi. Think about it. If I go 1 revolution, how many radians is that? 2 pi. If I go 2, how many ra ra uh, radians is that? 4 pi. So I go 2 times 230. Now, we get, now what are we going to divide, though? Yeah, 230 times 2 pi divided by 60 gives me, this will give me radians per second. Okay. Right. There you go. All right, so now that's omega naught. Now, it says that omega final equals 390. It speeds up RPMs. Do the same thing to the 390. In some circles, some physics books I've seen where they haven't changed it, and that always bothered me. I like change. I like keeping everything um, as radians per second. So you do the same thing to this guy. You take 390 times 2 pi divided by 60. All right. And um, now, if it went from 230 to 390, what happened to it? It accelerated. And a centripetal acceleration or a tangential acceleration or an angular acceleration. There's three of them we're talking about here in this, in this chapter. We've got centripetal, which is for this. We've got tangential, which we really haven't dealt with too much yet. And we've got angular. This is an angular speed. So what kind of acceleration did it go through? Angular. So we're talking about alpha. And alpha equals omega final minus omega naught over delta t. All right. So it's the question that they ask is when the, when the, it switched to high speed. Oh, guess what? They want us to find alpha, and they give us the time. I think we can do that. I think we're on it. Okay. What's the magnitude of the angular says? Oh, and then it asks, how many revolutions did it go through to get there? All right. So you want to listen to your Beatles White Album when you do this chapter? Because you say you want a revolution? Sorry, it's on there. So it's, it's, I got to stop bringing up these 60s and 70s references. All right, to children of the 90s. All right. Um, Oh, it wants to know theta. All right, well, there's several ways to find theta. It's just like finding x in chapter 2, finding the distance in chapter 2. So this time we're going in a circle, but it's the exact same thing. You can go, oh, I'll take the average times t. I can do that one. I can do theta equals um, omega naught t plus 1 half alpha t squared. I can do that one, especially since they gave me the time. I can do that one. Or I can do, oh yeah, theta final squared equals theta omega naught. Omega final squared equals omega naught squared plus one half alpha. Oh, what am I doing? Two alpha theta. And I can kind of coax theta out of that one. I'll tell you which one I'd prefer. I don't deal with quadratics very well. I like that average. So what, what would be the average? What's the average omega here? How do you find the average? Yeah, add them and divide by two. Add, add this and this and divide by two. That gives you omega, the average. We can do that because it said constant angular acceleration. You can't just, you can't, this only works, all of these only work when you have constant acceleration. Okay? And you don't have constant angular acceleration if all of a sudden 
Um, well, you could have, even in that. If you have a tangential acceleration, you may not have. Uh, well, yeah, you could. OK, sorry. I'm, I'm doing physics on the fly. That's dangerous. Be quiet now. All right, I will. OK, now. OK, then your next problem. You know what your next problem says? Your next problem says this. Oh, oh, and it wants to know how many revolutions it went through. So you'll find theta. So this will cause a problem because it wanted to know the revolutions. So if you find theta, how would you find the number of times it went around the circle? Div oh, Michaela, downtown Michaela Brown's got it. What is it? Divide by 2 pi. And that'll give you your revolutions. Okay? All right. Good. The next problem is the same thing. Okay? You got a flywheel that rotates. Problem, the, the very next one is the exact same thing. You got a flywheel that rotates. It is brought to rest. Ooh, this time it's brought to rest. So, what kind of acceleration do we have? Yeah, it's negative. Negative acceleration. And um, it, uh, it, what's the magnitude of that and how much time did it take? Well, you just use these, these equations right here. In other words, it went, it, they'll give you a starting and they'll give you a final. Okay? So you could, you could, so you can find the, because you got the starting, final, but they don't give you the time. So you'd have to use this guy to find alpha. And then once you find alpha, you can either, um, yeah, what am I saying? I'm confusing you. Oh, oh, it gives you theta. It gives you theta. It says it does it in 47 revolutions. So, do you go with 47 for theta, or what do you do? 47. Times 2 pi, right? Because one revolution is 2 pi, two revolutions 4, three le revolutions 6 pi, that kind of stuff. All right, good. Good, good, good. So you'll be okay. And then it wants to know how long it took to stop. Of this have a negative acceleration. All right. Ooh, these next two are a lot of fun. We got we got two problems left. Three problems. Two problems left. Two. Two. Okay. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We've got two problems. Now, here's the first one. Now we're getting into this. This is all fine and good. This is all fun. But let's get into some real, kind of the sexy side of physics, a little astronomy. All right. Just because it has cool pictures and everything else. All right. It's not sliding blocks. you got crab nebulas and things like that. So it's much, it's kind of, a little more as pleasing that way. All right. Um, here's what we got. We got an M object is taken to a height, a certain height, way above the Earth's surface. So we got the Earth right here. Okay. We're going to take an object way up here to a certain height. All right. Now, here's what we're dealing with. Here's what we're dealing with. Newton's law of gravity. That's Newton's uh, law of gravity, where the force between two objects is equal to this. Okay? And that's kind of a fun little exercise you can do if you wanted to find, in other words, if you want to find the acceleration that you pull on the Earth, okay, you could do this. You could do G, like let's take my, uh, let's say I'm. Uh, uh, 80 kilograms. G times 80 divided by, um, I think, 6.38 times 10 to the 6th squared. Look at this. This is 10 to the negative 11th. This is going to be 10 to the 12th down here. So it's like 10 to the negative ballpark 23rd. 
acceleration. That's not very much. See, so it's, it's, you can't even calculate it. So that's, that's our acceleration that I'm pulling the Earth at. But this is the force between two bodies, all right? And now, they want to know, um, what is the acceleration? Do they want to know the force of the acceleration? What's the object? Oh, they want to know its force. They want to know its weight up there. First of all, is its weight going to be greater or less than it is on the Earth? Less than, quite a bit less than. So here's how we do this. This, get, this is our weight, okay, because that's mg. All right, but now we've got a new mg because r is actually equal to the radius of the Earth plus h. Don't forget about this. You got the radius of the Earth plus h is your r, so it makes it a little bit trickier. All right, but not much. So if they tell you the height, this, I, I want to find out what the radius of the Earth is anyway. This is something people should know. Don't they have a table in this book somewhere? In the very back? All right, so I'm wasting Oh, here's the, here's the periodic table. I don't know anything about that. Miss Scarlett. But anyway, let's see. Mass of the Earth. Equatorial rate 6.378 times 10 to the 6. Yeah, 6.38 times 10 to the 6. I was pretty close. 6.38 times 10 to the 6. That works. That works for me. I like that. All right. Um, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So, so, Here's how, so they, wanted, they want to know what the force was. First of all, they asked this question. They said, what's the mass of the object if you take it 290 kilometers up in the air? What's the mass? Let's say the mass was 125 kilograms. Now you take it 290 kilometers up in the air. What's the mass now? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's like the half price story. It's the same thing. Right. It is. All right. So. The mass doesn't change. That's the first question they ask you. They're trying to be slick. All right. And the second question is, they want you to do this. They want you to find this force. So you just go G times M, mass of the Earth, times the mass of the object over RE plus H squared, where we figured out that RE is equal to 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. And they'll give you the H they'll give you. All right. So you can figure that out. It'll be a lot of fun. They did it differently. Oh, well, I like the way I did it. Okay. All right, now, now, let's figure out what our weight would be. Let's do some more astronomy here. This is kind of a fun problem. I like this one. Um, oh, well, there's kind of a, here's a different, here's, an, here's a new problem. It says, hey, it says a man has a mass on the Earth's surface of a certain mass, okay? They want to know how high does he need to go to lose 13% of his body weight? In other words, we've got to find H, okay? Basically, the way you do that problem, your problem might be different, might say 15%, or it might give a different kilograms, but if he's 13%, you'd go, oh, well, let's say he's uh, 70 kilograms, and so his weight here on Earth would be 70 times G. That's his weight here on Earth. Okay, and we want to figure out how high he needs to go to be 13% of that. Well, what you do is just take G 
times 0.87. And G times 0.87 then equals G times ME over RE plus H squared. And guess what, we're, guess what you're looking for? H. You got to go find, get H out of there. All right? It's a little algebra problem. But the initial thing was, if he wants to lose 13%, how high does he have to go up? That's the way you do it. All right. So you get used to seeing these types of problems. Because how many of you have done this before? Probably haven't seen these, th these types of things before. Right. Okay. All right, now. So the next, the last problem. Dun, 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 dun. What's the last problem? I, I, I didn't want to do it. I thought I was going to do like half of them, but I just kind of get on a roll. I like doing them. I don't know if you learn anything, but anyway, I have fun. All right. Um, the, uh, here it is. We're going to go to a neutron star. All right. We're going to go to a neutron star. This is kind of cool. What is our weight on a neutron star? Well, here's a neutron. Here's, here's the whole idea. Neutron, there's like a neutron star in the middle of the Crab Nebula. All right? And what we have is we've got something with the same mass of the sun, but it's only as wide as like from here to Grandview. But it's that massive. All right? That's massive. I mean, that's, that's dense. That's dense. That's very, very, very dense. So, even if we were to stand on the surface of this neutron star, we would probably get crushed pretty good. All right. Um, anyway, what they want us to do is, they say this. They say, okay, say you weigh 670 pounds on Earth. Say mg equals 670 newtons. Sorry, 600, you weigh 670 tennis balls. All right, that's not so bad. 670 tennis balls here on Earth. Right? That would be roughly 200 cans of, 220 cans of tennis balls. All right? Anyway, I'd say you're um, 670 newtons on Earth. They want to know how much would you weigh, how much would you weigh on a neutron star? And here's this neutron star. The mass of the star. The mass of the star is equal to 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. Which is roughly the mass of our sun. It's really kind of fun to write it completely out. All the zeros, all 28 zeros that go after that 99. All right. But we won't. Okay. All right. So. Anyway, so, th so that's the mass of the star. The weird thing is, the weird thing is, its diameter is only 19 kilometers. 19 kilograms. 19 kilometers. Which is uh, 19,000 meters, which its radius then is, what, 9,500? meters. So it's got a radius. It's as massive as the sun, but it has a radius that's like a little 10k run. Which you can do. All right. Wow. What would be your weight on this thing? Pretty easy to figure. All you'd have to do is your force on this neutron star would be um, that big G. What was big G again? 6.67 times 10 to the negative, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. So then that was that gravitational constant that Newton needed to make all his calculations work out right, and it did. All right, so that's a gravitational constant. Hasn't changed very much since when I took physics. It is changing, though, because things are slowing down, all that kind of stuff. But it won't change that much in our lifetime. It won't change between now and the next test. 
right? So we got G. So F is our weight that we're looking for. And so you just put in that mass of the star times the mass of the man. Which can we get the mass of the guy? Pretty easy. Yeah, and they walk you through it. They go, "What's the mass of the man?" Oh, well, if mg is equal to 670, I guess divide by g and you get the mass of the guy. All right, mass of the man divided by 9,500 squared. That's that. Now your your numbers might be a little bit different, and you're going to get something humongous. And then if you divide that by 9.8, you see how many times greater it is than the Earth. That's the number of Gs he'd be pulling. Remember, 2.9 Gs will make you pass out. This will be in the thousands. So you are now two inches tall. OK. All right. So that's a, see, astronomy is kind of the fun part of it because it, it, it tweaks the imagination, I think. All right, I think that's it. We're done. Now, you, now this weekend you can just fly.